So we are going to wrap up uh, the book of Luke next week. Uh, Pastor Matthew will be back, and I know he's excited to get back and teach with you, but I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being here, and thank you for allowing me the privilege and honor to speak to your lives and to your hearts these past three weeks. I have absolutely loved it, and I, I, I have a good time when I'm up here, so I hope that, that it's a beneficial experience for you as well. Um, so I got a question to ask you. And what I need you to do is I need you to raise your hand in response to this question. So my question to you is this. How many of you can think of one thing that you would like to change in your life right off the top of your head? You got one thing that you would like to change about your life. It could be anything. Okay. That, that confirms what I thought would happen. 90% of you raised your hand. Why? Because we think that if we change the things about our lives that we think need changed, that our lives will be better, right? So we think that if we change our health, we start exercising and eating healthier, our lives will be better. We think if we change how we look, if we change our appearance, if we lose some weight or, or maybe gain some weight and put on some, some muscles, we, we think that that will make our lives better. The first service I said buffer, and a buffer is a tool that you use to buff out stuff on cars not how you get stronger, not what you look like when you get stronger. It's more buff. That, that's the correct term. Um, last week, my wife corrected me uh, about a few words that I said, and said she, she told me that those weren't words. And so I'm a little anxious right now because I you never know what comes out of my mouth. <laughs> so. You could want a new phone. The iPhone 7S is coming out, and that might be a change that you want to make in your life because you feel like the iPhone 7S will make your life better, and it may. The wards, you may want to change your wardrobe. Sometimes new clothes just make us feel better, don't they? I, when I get a new pair of jeans, I enjoy wearing them, and it makes us feel better. House, uh, maybe you want to change a house or where you live, the location. Maybe someplace that doesn't change temperatures every five minutes. So maybe you want to try a new location. Maybe you want to change your cars, and you think that that will make life better. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's a personality trait. Maybe you want to change the fact that you're shy. Maybe it just bothers you that you're not more outgoing and you want to change that about you. Maybe you want to change the fact that you're nervous all the time. You just have this nervousness about you. I was just, I don't know if I was born this way, but ever since I can remember, I've always had just this little bit of nervousness and excitement about me. Adrenaline is always kind of pumping through my, my veins. And so I would love to change that about me just because there's always just that little bit of edge that I'm fighting through. Uh, maybe you just laugh funny and you want to change that about yourself. Maybe you want to fix a relationship. Maybe you got some tension in a relationship and you'd like to f- get that fixed. Or maybe you're looking to abandon that relationship and, and find a new one in hopes that that will fix the tension that you're experiencing right now. Maybe you want to change a behavior. Maybe you would like to react differently to the kids melting down. Maybe you would like to get rid of a, of a destructive pattern that you've noticed in your life that you don't like about yourself. Maybe you would like to change the circumstances of your life. Maybe you have a family member who's been sick and maybe terminally ill, and you would love to change that circumstance because if we could change these things about us, it would make our lives better, right? Now, I've got another question to ask you. How many of you, and you can go ahead and show me by raising your hand, how many of you can think of two things that you would like to change about yourself? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We have many, many areas in our lives, don't we? There's different facets of our life that that when one is in order doesn't necessarily mean that the other is always in order. And so does does changing one thing specifically mean that the other is going to change? Can changing your health make you better in, in, in every area of your life? Does it impact the second thing that you wanted to change? And think about it this way. And maybe it does. The answer to that question could be maybe. Because maybe getting healthier, maybe it changes how you look. And maybe changing how you look gives you some confidence. And maybe having some confidence helps you to overcome your shyness. And so, yes, it could be true that changing one area affects the other. But does that always the case? I mean, I want you to think about it. Does buying a car automatically make your marriage better? Depends on who you bought the car for. (laughs) If you bought the car for your spouse, it might make your marriage better. If you bought it for yourself, good luck to you. (laughs) 
So getting, your car, getting a new car doesn't always mean that your marriage will be fixed. Does fixing your marriage mean that your, your great aunt is going to get rid of her cancer? No. And so there's all these different areas of our lives that sometimes are affected if we better our lives in one way, and sometimes they're not. And let's just be honest. I, I don't know about you guys, but I can focus on about one thing at a time. And so I can get one thing under control in my life, and then all the other stuff just kind of falls to the wayside because I've, I've so focused on changing and fixing the one area of my life that the rest of it kind of falls apart. And so we have this. We want to make our lives better. We want our lives to be more happy and more healthy and more whole. And, and we want to do everything we can, but at times it just seems overwhelming to us. And, and changing one thing doesn't always change the other. But what if I told you that something has happened that can change everything? What if I told you that there's something that has occurred in the history of man that can change absolutely everything about you? And it can change even the course of history itself. And what I'm talking about is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It changed everything. And, and what I mean by the resurrection is I mean that the man, Jesus Christ, claimed to be the Son of God, claimed to be the Messiah, and he went to the cross, and he died on the cross, and three days later, he came back to life, and he still lives to this day. Now, because of this truth, because of the resurrection, we see that 12 men, 12 fishermen from Galilee, started the greatest, most profound religion that boasts the greatest number of people in, in a 2,000-year in history. See, 12 men, Christianity started from 12 men from Galilee going out and proclaim, proclaiming that, that Christ had died and rose again from the grave and that he could forgive your sins and make you right with God. And that was their message. And it, this message is the foundation of the Christian faith. And it is one of the largest, largest faiths, or largest religions in the world. Now, we can talk about those numbers, and, and, and you can argue with me that, that it's not genuine, whatever. I, I, it's still one of the most profound faiths, well-known faiths in the world, the Christian faith. And it started with 12 men from Galilee. The leaders changed the course of nations because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it changes our lives today. This, this, this didn't just change 12 men from Galilee. It didn't just change their lives. It changes the lives of men and women 2,000 years later. And so as we sit here today, the resurrection has the power to change everything in your life. And we're going to look at Luke's account today. And I didn't put it on the screen because it's a long passage, and so I would love for you to grab a Bible or grab your tablet or your phone, and you can follow along with the scripture. I'm going to read from uh, Luke chapter 24, and we're going to start in verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they were, um, and we're going to see later, but they were the women uh, who had prepared Jesus' body for burial. See, Joseph of Arimathea, I had to check that because my, my brain went, that's not the right name. Joseph of Arimathea, he goes to Pilate and asks to have Jesus' body. And so they get Jesus' body off the cross after he died, and they take him and put him in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. And the women had prepared his body in short notice because the Sabbath was coming. And so they would not have worked or done anything on the Sabbath day. So they, this was after the Sabbath, and they were going back to the tomb. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you why he was still in Galilee? The son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. 
And, and that's just like that, oh, yeah, I remember that now. That, that, that's that moment for him. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. You see, the disciples' first response, the men who had spent the most time with Jesus, their first response when they hear that Jesus is alive is they go, nuh-uh, that, that, that can't be true. Nobody in the history of the world has ever done this. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Can't you think in that moment that maybe Peter had a little bit of hope there? I mean, what happened right before the, the, or the last time that Peter had seen Jesus? He denies him, right? And maybe in Peter's heart, there's just that little spark of hope. It could be true. He could be back. He could have come back to life. He, he, he could have resurrected. And that's where we leave the disciples. And then Luke cuts to another story. Luke cuts to a story of two men walking on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And they're on the road, and they're having a discussion about the, the events that had happened the past few days, about Christ dying, and, and now that the ladies had come back and said that, that he had risen. And he, they're, they're just having this discussion, and they meet this man on the road. And this man draws close to them and starts walking with them, and he asks them, what are you guys talking about? And he says, it, it, the two men say, haven't you heard what's happened here? Are, are you such a, a newbie to the area that, that you haven't figured out what's going on? And so they explained to him that Jesus had went to the cross and he died. And, and now they, they think that he, his, his body was missing is what, what they say. And then they say, he says to them, well, why do you look so sad? And then he breaks the scripture down for him. And he says, from starting in Moses, he shows them that the Messiah must suffer, and he must die, and he must rise again. And these guys, as they're getting the scripture break, broke down to them, they're walking, and, and they finally get to the place where they're going, and, and the guy pretends like he's going to go farther. And they talk him into staying with them, and they, they go into the house, and they get ready to have dinner together. And we're going to pick up in verse 30. It says, when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed them and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. So you see, what we have is we have unbelieving disciples at first, but then something happens. Jesus shows up and appears to them in flesh and in blood, and he eats with them, and he dines, or he dines with them, and he, he spends time with them, and he says, here, Take your hands and put them in my nail scars and put them in my side. We see in John that Thomas meets him one time and, and, and Jesus actually has him touch him. And so here is Jesus, alive, breathing, enjoying life again in the flesh and blood right before the disciples' eyes. And so this truth, the resurrection, is not a story to the disciples. It's not a theory. It's not a dogma or, or, or a theological concept to them. It's their friend standing right before them in flesh and blood. Again, the thing that they had desired and hoped for, to be with Jesus again. And there he stood. And this changed their lives forever. The fact that Jesus had come back to life they went from men 
who were scared to death. They stood far off when the crucifixion happened. They weren't front and center. They stood at a distance. They ran and they abandoned Jesus in his time of need because they were scared that they would suffer the same fate as Jesus. These men, they hid themselves in a room so that the authorities would not find them. Jesus had to appear to them through a locked door. These men would become the founders of the Christian faith who would act through the power of the Holy Spirit so boldly that, I mean, have you ever read the, the, the sermons that Peter gave? Like, he's lucky that he didn't get beat just right there, there and then. He was like all up in people's face about stuff. He's like, you guys killed the Messiah, but you can repent and have life. Like, he didn't pull any punches. He was bold. He was courageous in his faith. These were the same men, and their lives changed because Jesus was alive again. And these men would stake their lives on the declaration that they worship not a great leader, not a man who died for his beliefs, but a God who was still alive, a God who went to the cross and died and is still alive today. This was the, cent the central message that they proclaimed to the world around them, and it cost them their life. That's how much they believed in the resurrection. That's how much they believed in Jesus, is that they were willing to give their lives to proclaim this message, because the message of the risen Savior was not just for them. Jesus didn't come back just for his disciples 2,000 years ago. He came back so that anybody who would believe that he died on the cross and rose on the third day, that their lives could be changed too. And that they could experience what Jesus had to offer them. And when I say trust, and the Bible talks about faith and trust, the disciples, if you look at how they trusted Jesus, it wasn't just a belief to them. They staked their lives on it. And this is the call to trust in Jesus for those who would experience the blessing of the resurrection now. And so he calls us to trust Jesus in such a way that we stake all of our life on it. He says it changes and impacts so much of who you are and what you do that it's going to take all of your life. And he says when you do, and the apostles will talk about when you trust Jesus this way, it's almost like you won't even be recognizable. Paul in 2 Corinthians says, therefore, if anyone, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And so he says that you'll be so different. You'll have changed so much that you won't even be recognizable. You'll be a completely new creation. And not just in parts of your life, but in every facet of of your life, you'll have changed. And so what are some of those implications? Because through the power of the Holy Spirit, he wants, the resurrection has the power to change our lives today. And so what are those things that he wants to change? What are the changes that he makes in our lives when we find truth and that Jesus died for our sins and that he still lives? Well, I could teach for hours and hours and hours on end to go through all the implications of the resurrection, but I'm not going to do that, so you can all breathe. But I do want to touch on the major ones. I want to touch on the ones that have the most overreaching impact on our lives, and it starts with the fact that the resurrection changes who we are. You see, on the cross, Jesus forgave our sins. And he restored our relationship with God. And it was in the resurrection that he validates everything that he did and everything that he said he was. You see, on the cross, he died for our sins, but in the resurrection, he shows that he's more powerful than sin and death. He shows that he is the true Messiah, that he does have the power to forgive our sins and the right to forgive our sins, that he does have the ability to restore our relationship with God. 
And so what we see is an exchange happen. And I kind of mentioned this last week. We, we go from enemies of God to sons and daughters of God. And Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 says this. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Now, I don't want you to get hung up on that, that word predestined. All I want you to understand, and, and what Paul is wanting you to understand, is that God put in place a plan so that you could go from enemies, from being enemies of God, to being sons and daughters of God. God planned for you to be sons and daughters of him. He wanted to make you part of his family. He wanted to give you a new identity. And, and, and how do we get our identity? How do we pursue our identity? Don't we have to go chase after it? Don't we have to go find something that we're good at so that we can say that's who we are? Don't we stake our, our body image on it from time to time? And then, and then when hap what happens when those things change? What happens when you retire? If, if your identity is staked in your career, you lose your identity when you retire. I know, and I've talked to a few older gentlemen who are going through some things where they're just like, I just don't know what to do. I don't know who I am anymore because I, I, I can't work. I can't do the same things that I used to do. And so in Christ, if Christ is our identity, if son or daughter of God is our identity, we don't lose that in the same way that we would lose um, our identity if it's in our job. What, and again, what if it's in, in your body image? Trust me, it changes. I, I'm not the same man that I was when I was 18 years old. I can't do the same things. I don't look the same. It, it changes. And so when these things go, what do we do? And so Christ came to give us an identity that never changes, that can never be taken away from us. And that if we're in him, we are sons and daughters, and that is who we are. Not only does it change who we are, but it changes our desires. We go from en being enemies because that is what we desired. We desired everything that stood in opposition to God. We desired to pursue life on our own, outside of the need of God the Father. And, and this was, these were the desires of our heart. And yet when the, when the resurrection happened and it changed who we are, it also changed our desires. It changed the fact that we no longer, it changed us to wanting what God wants. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says this, For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And what Paul is saying here is that, that when, when the resurrection happened, when, when our desires change, we now can think and see things how God sees them. He, he quotes the scripture in the very beginning. He says, for who has understood the mind of the Lord to instruct him? And that comes from Isaiah. And in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah is laying out how amazing God is, that none of us have the capability to understand who God is and what he's doing and what he's doing in the world. But then Paul says, with that question there. He says, for we have the mind of Christ. And he says that because he spent the whole chapter prior to it explaining how the spirit now lives inside of us and how we can think like Christ thinks, that we can see people the way that Christ sees people. We can, we can see the world the way that he sees it. We understand that, that when God requires something of us or he asks something of us, that, that it's for our good, not necessarily to take something away from us. And so God begins to make that shift in our hearts. And let me just say this. If you're here today and you're like, man, I don't know that I always desire what God, what, what I think God would desire. We don't do this perfectly. We don't get it right all the time. And yet, if you're here today and you go, man, I want to do what God wants me to do, but I just feel like I, I can't do it. I want to want what God wants, but I don't know that I want it right now. You know what that is? 
That's the Holy Spirit beginning to work in your life. And I would encourage you to fan that into flame. Because as you do that, you will see God change your heart from being one that stands in opposition to who he is to one that desires the same thing that God desires. Now, the resurrection doesn't just change our desires, but it also changes our ability to fight sin. Romans 6 says that we were slaves to sin, that it so encapsulated us, that it was, it, it, it was so a part of our lives that it permeated everything that we did and that we were enslaved to it, that, that no matter how hard we tried, we couldn't get away from the fact that we were in our sin. But the resurrection changed all that. The resurrection gave us the ability to choose obedience, not sin. Romans 6 verse 1 says this, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace by, may abound? By no means. Now, this is Paul. Paul was posed with a question by the Roman church. And what they said was, well, if, if we sin and God forgives us, doesn't that put God's grace on display? And so if we sin more or we continue in our sin, that just means that God is going to forgive us more and that, that more grace will be seen and people will glorify God. And, and, and Paul goes, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. He says, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we could no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we, we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so we saw what Paul was talking about right here in front of us today. We saw people come up and come into this baptismal bathtub thing. And we saw them get in there. And we saw them go back into the water and then to come up again. And Paul says, all of that is a representation of what is happening in our lives when we unite with Christ. That we are dying to our old selves. We're dying to the sin that we once liked. That we're dying to, the, to, the, to those things in our lives. And we're being raised into new life. We're being raised into obedience. We've been given the ability and the power to fight sin because of the resurrection. You see, with the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we no longer have to be defined by our sin and we no longer have to live in it. Now that doesn't mean that we are gonna live it out perfectly, again. That doesn't mean that we're gonna go and we're not gonna sin ever again in this life. We, remember, what I'm saying is we have the ability to fight sin. That means we have the ability to say no when we're tempted. We have the ability to walk away. And honestly, this is why Paul and the apostles who wrote the New Testament, why they're constantly calling people, calling their churches to remember and to look at the resurrection. Look at it. Because, and then, and then he uses language like put on, and then he'll give you a list of behaviors that, and attitudes that, that God would find glory, glory in. And he says, put away these sinful behaviors. And, and so he's constantly reminding the church, fight for the life, the new life that God has given you. Fight for the new life that God has won in you. And, and you can put away sin. The resurrection also changes our purpose for living. You see, we go from living, from, living for ourselves to living for God. 
Romans 14, 7 through 8 says, For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. And so if the bulk of our lives are spent pursuing our happiness and our joy and our purpose, if, we're, if we spend our time trying to make an identity for ourselves, we have to live for ourselves, right? If that's where we get those things, we have to live for ourselves because nobody else is going to give it to us. But because of the resurrection and because we are united with Christ, it says that we don't have to do that anymore, that we are united to the source of all those things that we go chasing after and that he can give them to us freely. And so what that does is that changes our lives. It, it takes us from being people who have to hoard and protect and, and, and fight for what we need in our lives to, to being people who can be generous. We can be generous with our time and our money and our, and our resources and our energy. We can be generous with those things because we're tapped into the source. And he provides those things for us. We can, we can live for the gospel with sharing the gospel. And we can put aside how, how silly we may feel that that will make us. Because he lived for the gospel. Because our identity isn't in how silly we look or how put together we look. It's in, it's in Christ. And we can live for the mission that Christ had to make disciples in this world. And we can give our lives to that. Why? Because our purpose and our peace and our joy and our happiness is found in Christ. And he says, all of that is yours. You don't have to chase it anymore. I'll give it to you. Now go and pursue the purpose that I have for you. And then lastly... The resurrection does for us something so profound that, that I believe that it's, it's the change that, that, that really is the basis for everything that we talked about up till this point. And see, the resurrection changes our destiny. And what it does is it gives us hope. The resurrection gives us hope that the things that we fear the most in our lives, sin, Suffering, death, all of those things, they will not affect us forever. My, um, this past week, I went to a funeral in, in my hometown. One of my cousins, actually my mom's cousin, passed away this last week, and she was 58 years old, and she suffered from a condition called ataxia. And if you don't know what that is, essentially, she was born, and, and it looked like that she would live her life as a normal, healthy child. But about seven years old, she started losing the ability to walk. And what ataxia does is it, 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 it keeps your body from being able to coordinate muscle movement. And so she, about seven years old, she realized she started losing her balance, and she started having to walk with crutches. Well, eventually it got so bad that she started to have to walk with a walker. And then it got so bad that she started to have to, to sit in a wheelchair, and she was wheelchair ridden. And she started losing function of her arms. And then she started losing function with her speech. And, and eventually this condition would take her life. And so she lived with this. And, and, and what was profound is that I was sitting at the funeral service. And, and I had known, her name was Denise. And I had known Denise my entire life. And we would play games with her. And we would play board games and do things. And we spent our entire lives around her. And, and, and as I was sitting there at the funeral, I was listening to how profound her thoughts were around her suffering and, and just how profound it was around her faith because she wrote in a journal. She kept a journal for many, many years. And so at the funeral, I'm sitting there and I'm listening to them read some of her thoughts as she processed through her suffering because, you see, in every shape of the word, she understood what life was like to be free from the wheelchair and to be free from the walker and those things. She had life with, without those things at one point. And so she watched her life deteriorate right in front of her own eyes, being old enough to understand and, and remember. And this caused so much frustration and so much struggle for her. And, and, and even to the point where she wanted to walk away from God. 
In, in these writings, they read that the how she struggled with, she wanted to be an atheist. She could not understand why God would allow her to experience this. But over time and through prayer, she talked about how she came to her faith and to the trust that because of the resurrection, because Christ still lived, that there was, there was hope in the face of her suffering. And that, and that her suffering would not, in the end, define her. Because in the end, she knew that one day she would live with Christ and that her disease would not define her anymore. The condition would no longer keep her from walking because Christ was able to correct and to fix everything that she had suffered through in her life. And so we sit here today and we all have things that we struggle with. We all have sins that we're fighting. We all have sickness from time to time that we're trying to overcome. We all have a fear that one day death is coming for us. And yet in the face of that, the resurrection means that we can have hope and that it will not always have the last say. And so that addiction that you can't get rid of, that you hate, that behavior that you're trying to put to death, but you just can't do it. The resurrection means that you have hope that one day it won't bother you anymore. That depression and that anxiety that you can't quite shake, the, that, that condition that, that won't leave you alone, one day it will not bother you anymore. One day we'll all live forever for those in Christ. We'll live forever with him, free from the things that so bother us here on this earth that so haunt us here on this earth and that we will be free of it. This is what the resurrection has won for us. For those in Christ, the resurrection changes everything. And if we trust Jesus the way that the disciples trust Jesus and we stake our lives on the fact that our Savior still lives it will change everything for you right now. It's not once we get to heaven. Jesus won the ability for your lives to change from this moment forward. Christ lives. He is risen. And it changes everything. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for Thank you that you gave us a truth so profound that, that is an, it's unparalleled in this world, Lord God. But the greater truth is, Lord, that not that you just came back from the dead, though that is an amazing miracle, but God, that, that the promise is for those who will put their lot in life with you, for those who will trust you, that we can experience the same thing and that we can have hope even in this life as we fight and we struggle that we can know that one day we won't anymore. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would speak to our hearts today. God, where we gotta fight sin, I pray that you'd help us. Where we need hope through a sickness, I pray that you would give that to us, God. Where we need hope, God, in whatever it is that we're fighting through today, I pray that the resurrection would stand as a testimony and as a truth and as a reality that you're greater than all of those things. Lord, thank you for being here with us today. And it's in your precious name, amen.